Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. This week on our panel, we have Nader Davitt. Hello. Justin Bennett. Mike Issues. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Issues. If you, if you didn't catch that, Mike Issues. <laughs> Lucas Heiss. Hello, everybody. Dave Sedia. Hey, everybody. And Dave, you're a new panelist. I just wanted to call that out. So you want to just remind people who you are real quick, and then they'll get used to you being on the show? Yeah. Um, so um, I blog about React. I've uh, been sort of like doing the React education thing for a while. Got a book and courses and that kind of thing. Good deal. I feel like I forgot somebody, but I don't think I did. I'm Charles Max Wood from devchat.tv. And uh, we've got a couple of special guests here. We've got Thomas Eilert. Eilert? Hello! A lot. A lot. <laughs> That's right. I think you told me that before. Yeah. Just remember to park in the A lot. Don't park in the B lot. I uh, gotcha. <laughs> and uh, we also have Conlin Durbin. Hello. So hopefully I said your name right too. <laughs> you did. That was perfect. All right. Well, do you gentlemen want to introduce yourselves real quick? Sure. I can go. Um, so I'm Conlin Durbin. I am a software engineer at a company in, company in Indianapolis called Lessonly. I focus on our front end there. I write about React and stuff every now and then. Um, I love JavaScript, so it's uh, a lot of fun to write about and fun to talk about and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. And Thomas? Hello. Um, so I am a web guy from the eight, from the 90s. I was briefly on the React team, and I make uh, thingsthatdostuff.com and also uh, groovytiesquad.com with my wife. <laughs> nice. Hey folks, I just want to let you know quickly about Netlify. Netlify is a really cool system for hosting what are traditionally known as static sites. However, the real benefit that I've been finding is that I don't have to mess with a back end. I can just set things up. I build the website out. I've been using a system called 11 djs and you just deploy it. And then anything that you have that you want to do, you can do on the front end. So if you want to pull in some kind of database with Firebase or something else, if you want to collect form data, Netlify provides all kinds of services that make it easy to do all that stuff. If you're trying to do serverless, they have a really, really neat serverless setup that will allow you to deploy your websites without having to deploy a backend and it'll do some of the work for you. I, I just, I just love it. So if you're looking for a way that you can actually deploy a website that only has front end technology in it, gives you all the tools that you typically need for the back end without having to actually program the back end, then give them a try. Go check them out at Netlify.com. So I, I, I think I messed something up because Thomas, I think you're also a new panelist. That's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I messed up, I guess, when people were uh, joining the panel. So do you want to just uh, chime in and I guess you did the the reminder, but haven't we had you on an episode before as well? Yeah, it just aired like y double yesterday. Right. All right, cool. Yeah, and hopefully Justin figures out his mic issues. But anyway, so we're talking about linked lists in the wild, React hooks. And it seems like React hooks is something we've talked about here quite a bit, but what do linked lists have to do with React hooks? I'm kind of curious there. Yeah. Reminds so me of that... my computer science days in college. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of why I wrote that article was that I had not run into linked lists ever in actual programming uh, outside of college. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they use linked lists under the hood to kind of render hooks every time that they're created. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because in every like interview, people like job interview for software engineers, people are like, why do we have to do this linked list stuff? <laughs> We never use this stuff. <laughs> then it's like, yeah, now React uses this stuff really. <laughs> yeah. And they well, use them, I think, to kind of just maintain like the integrity of the hook chain. So um, it, it means that like your hooks will not update when React updates. It like ties them really closely to the fiber and to a lot of the other internal React stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's just interesting that they decided on linked lists um, over like, an array or something. So a couple of weeks ago, I was at CodeBeam, which is an Elixir and Erlang conference, and they were talking about the Erlang VM, and they use linked lists there a lot. And apparently, it's also very, very memory and processor efficient when you have to move things into it or out of the list. And they, they use both linked lists and doubly linked lists, which means that they're linked both ways instead of just what's next. Uh, if I may ask the stupid question, uh, what's a linked list again? <laughs> 
Um, I mean, in JavaScript, isn't it basically just an object with the keys and values? Yeah, pretty much. Um, a linked list is just an object that has a next property that points to another object that has a next property. Um, so you can link down the list of things. Um, and it it's quick because you can just say, you know, at this point, you know, go four things in, change that next to this object, and then change that object's next to another object. That makes sense. There's got to be a name for everything, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can't just call it the, a, a, a thing with a next property that is also that thing. <laughs> That's just too long. Yeah. I think in more uh, strictly object-oriented programming languages, they are more of a defined thing because you're actually like creating real classes that have like real linked list potential. But in JavaScript, they just kind of end up being objects. <laughs> Got it. And is like all the other job interview things also happen in React? Did they reverse the linked list? Did they? <laughs> they pretty much just use them. I mean, so fibers also have linked list implementations, which I just learned. I don't know how it works exactly. But uh, within the hooks stuff, they're pretty much just linked lists that they use to maintain the integrity of the hook chain. No reversing, no other stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, probably the, the, the only thing that may, makes me a little bit uh, worried with the hooks is that like, I love the interface. I love the problems that they're solving. I, I think that they are, it, it's a better way of sharing functionalities between components than like render props and hire the components. But I'm a little bit afraid because we know that all abstractions leak at some point, and there will be a, a day where like, you have like this weird performance issue in production, and we will need to learn how these things work under the hood. So it seems that hooks are, are not very trivial, right? The way they, they, they work under the hood. So how are, are we going to deal with it? Like, how are we going to deal with the fact that things are not very simple. And should this impact adoption or something like that? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think a good first step is just looking at the, you know, the request for comments that Facebook put, uh, put out. And uh, I mean, they're in React now, so that's not as uh, important anymore. But then just looking at the implementation and understanding how it works, which was the point of that article, was just to look and see Mm -hmm. How do these work? Why do they work the way they work? It, yeah, and, and it's a weird question because, like you said, at some point all abstractions leak. But hopefully, like, Facebook is using these, and so they will find the leaks and fix them. Um, but who knows? Uh, there are performance questions. There are some other questions there. Yeah, I don't, I don't think I, I've, I've ever, like, met... Any uh, I ever used any like library or framework that at some point with enough time in production you 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 just need to to learn how how these things work. Like I, it was not long ago, like four months ago, like our applications start to be like twice slower than 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 the the week before, and we we really needed to 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 go into like how the props and the, and things re render stuff like that, and we need to, to put, get our hands real dirty inside the code. So yeah, I think it's, it's really good that these blog posts like that you are writing things like that because it's, it will help when it starts happening with the hooks and it will start. That's kind of like a given. I think, I think yeah. this is generally been true of React from the beginning though. It's like you need to kind of like at the very beginning is like you need to know what the render cycle is and how that affects your performance. And now with hooks, there are like for sure gotchas. Like there are things you can't do with hooks and you have to know like what those are. Um, and, you know, for sure there'll be performance issues as well. But that's always been true of React and, and probably any other tool that you use. I mean, at some point you're going to need to know at least a little bit deeper than surface level of how it works. It's partly... Um it's something that you can kind of stave off from the beginning. Um, first of all, if you know, just keeping track of your performance and graphing it over time so that you can see when and where and how performance regresses 
and react quickly. That's critical in a CI CD kind of way. But also really, I mean, doing the the last thing that I would do or next to last thing that I would do is actually read and take the time to understand the documentation because they like spill all the beans of like, don't do this. The here's why. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it's every time I, I'm choosing like a library or something like that, I'm trying to look at at this point too. Like I, I was even thinking of writing a blog post about it. Like when it leaks, it's not like if it leaks, right? When it leaks, how, like what is the support I have? Like how, is there a place where I can ask questions? How documented this, this the, the, the problems are? Like how can I, I understand so, because I've never been in a situation where I could say like, yeah, this thing's like, is, is working abstractly so well this to me that I never needed to, to, to understand how this works. So, yeah, when I, when I see blog posts like yours, Colin, that's, that's the first thing I think. It's like, okay, I'm understanding this thing a little bit more now. Yeah, I mean, that's... 100% why I wrote it. Um, when I was first learning React, actually, um, kind of to Justin's point a little bit, I found some tutorials online, uh, some blog posts that basically were talking about like the implementation of the virtual DOM and like how all of React basically works at like a very simplistic level, which I think is a really, really great way to learn those kinds mm-hmm. of things, right? If you can implement your own version of the virtual DOM just for fun, uh, it helps you a lot when you're understanding, you know, uh, how React actually renders things. I totally agree. Like when when they first suggested that I join the team, I was like, "Well, what if we did React a completely different way and tried to build my own like com- com- competitor to React, just to kind of own for myself why this is hard?" <laughs> and it's hard. It's a hard pro- set it of is. problems. Well, and it's cool too because I think the Fiber implementation, like the new it's yeah. like six, version sixteen or whatever, when Fibers came out, was that, but within the Facebook team, somebody basically just said, "What if we did this better? What if and React, it, but better? Yeah, <laughs> but more. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I read it that like uh, before hiring someone to do something, you should try to do yourself, so you understand the 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 value of that thing." That works pretty well with like house maintenance stuff. Just yeah. try a little bit, yeah, and yeah. then give a lot of value to the people who are coming to yeah. Yeah, fix their stuff. And I think it's 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 a similar thing to to development, right? We should try a little bit to 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 deserve some time, like try to build those stuff and see how difficult it is. Yeah, I think it's really nice to know kind of like how things work under the hood to some level too, because. You know, you sort of don't know what you don't know, and I feel like if <laughs> if it's just this black box, you're you're sort of like constantly living in fear that one day the box is going to break. And you don't you're not going to know why. <laughs> yeah, and it like, will. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's that abstraction leaking problem. Yeah. yeah, anything that can kind of build up that level of certainty, so you feel you have confidence to build on top, so you know yeah. you're not building on quicksand, or yeah. to know where the quicksand is, I guess. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, w- one question for for you all. So, how do, how do you approach that? So, do you think that the approach of like a normal uh, university thing uh, that like I will learn the basics and learn a bunch of what they call the fundamentals, and then I go to the world, or do I look at like okay, I'm I'm using React. Oh, there's a linked list thing. I'm gonna study that. Like, what is the What's the way that like someone starting today should approach problems like these? Because you can, if you tell someone who's starting, okay, you need to know how everything works under the hood, they they will be like desperate. So, what's the correct approach to to that? Should you use stuff and wait for them to the abstractions to leak to start learning, or is there some fundamentals that you can start learning today? Uh, yeah, I mean, I I can start. Um, I, let me, I guess, I'll, let me talk about, I guess, how I went about that for a minute and then maybe uh, what was not good about that. I got very lucky and had a consulting job in college um, that let me learn JavaScript. We were using Backbone at the time and uh, nobody on the team really quite understood how things were working, kind of that leaky abstraction thing. So I basically said, I'm going to take a year while working this job uh, and still going to school and learn everything I can about JavaScript and watch like every video I can find and do all of this stuff so that I know 
the baseline there. Um, I think that there's, there's this like concept from Feynman. I don't know if you nuclear engineer who worked on the Manhattan project, but he has this idea that like when you're learning something, you should write the sentence, right? So, so if we were doing it for react, it would be react is a, and then the next word. And like, when you get to something that you don't understand, you start it over. So if it's React is a JavaScript framework, huh. it's like, okay, well, if I don't know what JavaScript is, now I start that over. JavaScript is a programming language. Like, all right, well, what's programming? Like, and then you just keep going until you reach the level that like you can write the whole sentence without like without hitting something that you have to dig deeper into. Um, wow. It's a lot, but at some point we all reach, you know, like everybody knows what a language is. And so if you can define a, a language and then a programming language and then JavaScript and then react for yourself. You can start to build up these like towers of knowledge. What I don't think worked super well about that is that not everybody has uh, that amount of time to spend on things. If you're trying to learn in the workforce or trying to learn not in college and not at a job where you're lucky enough to, to, to have that, it can be very difficult. Yeah. Kind of my, my recommendation as far for like people trying to break into the industry is to, to think of it like two different things. It's like on the one hand, you're learning what the actual job is, like where the rubber hits the road, how to get stuff done in reality. And the other side is like learning more depth of the technology because one, on, on the one hand, you want to be able to get hired and to solve problems in the real world. And usually you're not going to have to mess with framework stuff. And if you are, there's probably a red flag there. But at the other side of things, when things go wrong, you want to at least understand the concepts of, of how to, like what questions to ask. Yeah. Is that, yeah, this is, this is, it's really complicated. Usually w what I think about is try to, try to have at least a little bit of your daytime to learning something. And the, the good thing is that if it's 15 minutes a day, it's like better than like four hours in a Sunday, you know, this kind of thing that it's so difficult to get, like when your life is busy. So yeah, like if you have a commute that like here in New York, we always commute like with train subways and stuff. It's a moment to, to, to read about something like it's five minutes every day learning about something is better. So now... Uh, in, since this is like very React based, you have like uh, Dan Abramov writing those gigantic blog posts about everything. Like read read those a little bit like every day, and you will always like come up to. Uh, I particularly uh, enjoy uh, reading about like other engineering fields and how they deal with mm -hmm. their weird stuff, like the Boeing's falling down, things like that. It's like it always helps you when, when you arrive into weird situations of like, okay, like why did our performance degrade that much? Or why is this bug happening when it was not supposed to happen because none of our tests? So this is the moment. Like I, I think it pay, pays off to, to, to study like a little bit every day. Sometimes yeah, you have more time, sometimes you don't. But a little bit is always better than, than nothing. Yeah, cultivating that curiosity is important, isn't it? So I think coming into things and, and wondering why something is the way it is and not just stopping at like, oh, I could never figure that out or I don't care mm. why that is the way it is or whatever, like digging into that and saying, oh, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to research it a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, you, know, you don't have to spend the whole day on it or whatever, but just digging in enough to, to sort of satisfy that curiosity and then move on to the next thing. I think there's sort of the, the balance of, you know, learning everything up front versus learning just in time. I think maybe neither one is, is great in isolation. Like you can't just learn everything and then go and do your job. That's never right. Gonna happen. <laughs> and you also can't like just learn nothing and then just start doing things. So like you kind of have to, you have a mix of both. And it's sort of like you're constantly ping-ponging between like, I'm going to dive deep into this, learn the basics, start doing stuff, and then and kind of like circle back and fill in the gaps as you go. Yeah, the way that I did it is... Um just by reading the mood tools source code back in the day. And I would come across something that was like, what on earth does that mean? And then I'd have to, you know, dive down the rabbit hole. And then I'd finally like figuring out what the heck this meant in JavaScript. Oh, good grief. <laughs> I needed yeah. IRC's help. 
to teach me about this. Yeah, that's a tricky thing too. I think if you're if you're going from source code and trying to reverse engineer things, like how they work, I feel like this happens with, yeah, like if you're just trying to look at JavaScript code and figure out what this does, you have to see a lot of examples before you figure that out. <laughs> like at some point, it's, it's better to just go like read the docs, figure it out. Then. Yeah. But people learn in different ways. Yeah. Not, a, not everything works for everybody. But definitely, yeah. it is important to, to see what did work for other people. Like Colin, how did you learn all this stuff yourself? Yeah. Um, so so in, in that kind of the same vein of like, you know, digging into source code, um, digging into the React hooks stuff was like a great way to learn about them. The nice thing is Facebook comments everything like nice. absurdly well. So you know, they had comments about how every single thing in the hooks code was working and like why it was there, what it did. Uh, and then, you know, writing about that stuff or like making a video or giving a conference talk on those things as you learn them, I think is a great way to really solidify your learning. But then it also leads to like the videos that I watched when I was learning JavaScript. There's uh, a really, really good JSConf video on the event loop in JavaScript. And if you haven't seen that, like, um, us, I don't know what the link is for sure, who, who did it for sure, but it's very, very good. And like, that was the immediate thing that I needed to like satisfy the, the like need for that knowledge. Um, and that came out of somebody just saying, I wonder how the event loop works. Let me look into it and build something that lets me try it out and learn it. So. I think that was uh, What the Heck is the Event Loop Anyway by Philip Roberts at JSConf EU 2014. Yep, that's it. Sweet. Oh, I was thinking about the Jake Archibald one. There's another one that's really good too, where he's got these animations of like how the event loop works. Yeah. 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 I don't know what yeah uh, explaining to, 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 to other people is a really good way of making sure like to weed out the the, the problems with the with the thing in your in your mind. Because you're always be thinking like, what if, what if people ask me something about this part, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you will yeah. really like need to to look at all the edge cases of the knowledge in your yeah. in your mind. But one thing that that you that you said uh, was interesting. Just uh, I just thought about this now after saying, if you try to teach like as soon as you learn, it's an interesting moment, right? Because a lot of times when we are going to to teach something that we've been doing like for, I don't know, years, we lose a little bit of that perception of like not knowing something, right? And then we are explaining like when you, when you just learn something, you start explaining it, you still have a, a really fresh like memory of the moments where you didn't, you had no idea what, of what was happening, right? So, quickly under, uh, uncovers what you don't understand too. You like start explaining something. And you're like, oh, uh, I don't actually know how that works. <laughs> but here's other stuff that I do understand. It's like the the way that I've been understanding it is like there there are two ways of taking in new information. Either you know passively just like consuming or actively like like interacting with people. But then there are t- you don't like digest it in the moment. You all, you need to take time to like piece it together and like to take all that stuff you consumed and really understand it, but you can do silently, you know, with the doors closed just in your head or out loud to other people. Yeah. And I think that silent uh, version is kind of what you run into where you just start to assume that everyone knows the same things you did. Cause like you figured it <laughs> out on your own. And, and so that becomes that problem of like, then when you're explaining it to somebody, you just assume that they're going to know what the this keyword does or like how the event loop works or how React hooks like work under the hood. You know, there's all these questions um, that when you're learning it silently or, you know, digesting it silently, you don't hear anybody else's question. You don't get to hear the question that every mm-hmm. single person asks when you explain it. And so yeah. you don't know to, to explain that part every time you learn it. Yeah, but I, I'm really enjoying this this uh, hashtag that's been going around is uh, learning in public, just like people learning new things and being willing to be embarrassed by I don't already know this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So yesterday, I I we use a tool here at Zocdoc called Speed Curve to measure the performance of the application stuff. 
it's a really good tool and my team was like okay so you're talking about the speed curve measurements and we don't understand it very much uh, half of the team is like back end focus and stuff so I said okay I'm going to make a presentation it's going to be like a 20 minutes speed curve session I'm going to talk about everything that I look when I look at at our website on speed curve I'm going to try to explain everything make as many questions as you, as you can because I also want to to tell you like when I don't know something what's my thought process for like and where where do I go for for answer. So that was interesting too. So like I, I present something to, to the team and they started and there were like at least two or three questions that I had no idea. Like what exactly is that metric that I didn't pay a lot of attention to? And it's like, okay, so I don't know. So what, what do I do now to, to learn? And I pull up like the resources and stuff like that. So I'm also trying to uh, not only share specific like piece of knowledge, but also like thought process around, around something. Yeah, um, if I can, I'll do a little plug for the company I work for because we actually <laughs> kind of just do that. Um, so I work for a company called Lessonly. We build lesson building software, typically used by like sales teams and um, customer support teams, but really works anywhere. Um, and so for our product team, one of the things we do a lot of is like if you learn something or if you're working on something, you're highly encouraged to go create a lesson on it and share it with the rest of the team. Oh, um, so it's a little more of an ad hoc version of giving a presentation. But one of the first things I did was uh, when I started was create a lesson on accessibility and just share that out because it was something that I was passionate about and interested in and was learning about. And it was just a great way to really solidify, you know, how am I going to talk about this? Uh, how can we go about talking about this as a company? And what does the wider world kind of think about this thing and how do we integrate that? So yeah, it's just a neat uh, learning within a company and, and really developing that culture of teaching and learning kind of at the same time and together is, is really great. Yeah. That's really cool. So moving from the, from the hooks uh, post, there's another post that you wrote Colin that I thought it was really interesting because it rings at least a thousand bells in my mind, <laughs> which was the stop trying to be so dry instead, write Everything wise, everything twice. So the wet <laughs> as opposed to, to dry. So I don't know. Let's let's go to, to that subject, everybody. Sure. Would you, would you explain what's wet as opposed to dry programming? Yeah. So uh, I was talking a little bit um, to David before this, and just talking about the fact that like that post was one that I wrote in like 15 minutes, and then exploded and got just an absurd <laughs> amount of like views and. Um, I didn't expect it to at all, but uh, <laughs> I think I struck a nerve um, with a lot of people. I think kind of what you were saying that people were really interested in like that topic. But um, it, yeah, the, the concept is essentially that, you know, too often when we do things to be very dry, uh, don't repeat yourself, right? Um, we get into premature abstraction territory. So you write a component and instead of making that component, just do what you need it to do. You try to think of like, every single use case that it could be used for in the future, which you're never going to think of them all. And inevitably you're going to hit in three months. Somebody goes, why doesn't this component do this? And then you go, Oh yeah, good point. So the concept is write everything twice. So, so write your component to do what you need. And then the next time you're writing something similar and you think to yourself, haven't I already done this? You know, make a note about it and then you make your next, then the next time that happens, think about refactoring because by the time you have three use cases, you're probably at a pretty good point that you can like write a generalized component that's abstracted and not repeat yourself anymore. And the, the write everything twice is just a fun little like, <laughs> or, you know, anti dry. Um, I love it. And this has been explained. I think a lot, like there's the rule of three, um, which is basically the same thing. There's a lot of those out there um, where people have written about this in various programming books. One thing that I saw in that, in that post is that in the comments, a lot of people were telling you like, this is not the true dry, like you're yeah. not. So what, what, what was that uh, reaction? Like what, what people were talking about, like the true dry, what it means and how does it relate to that? Yeah, I think, you know, 
pe- people get dogmatic in their stuff. So when you start telling them that like dry programming isn't good anymore, um, they start to defend it. And I don't, I, I think, you know, uh, this, like I said, was a 15 minute article that I wrote like <laughs> real quick. Didn't really think about those repercussions, but, um, true dry programming is a lot closer to what I described in that post. The problem is when you use something like dry, that's just a nice little acronym that people throw around all the time and, you know, leave, you know, uh, it's looks good to me. You know, your code is really dry, right? That starts to really fundamentally get into your brain as a, well, I shouldn't ever repeat anything, uh, which is not the, the true dry concept. The, uh, the real concept has something to do with like, only having single sources of truth within your application. So, mm-hmm. you know, a component that that does something very, very, very similar to something else should be abstracted. And But that abstraction, you know, dry gets into premature uh, abstraction stuff and, and all that kind of thing. I think yeah. with Sandy Metz, um, who's a Ruby programmer, um, has something in one of her books about, uh, or it, it's better have duplicated code than a, wrong abstraction uh or some quote like that but yeah it's a lot easier to reason about you know why something is duplicated than it is to figure out like why something is kind of shoehorned into spots that maybe it shouldn't be shoehorned into yes yes so i've been in situations where the situation uh, the the company had like three front-end projects and they were like why do we have like three uh, webpack configurations that are almost uh, the same. So they created a package that is a function that generates a webpack configuration. Of course, with new, <laughs> of course, with new projects, you need to, to <laughs> be a little bit more different here and there. You add parameters to that function. So in the end, now you have a gigantic function that re- that gets like an object as a as an input that is almost as complex as the Webpack configuration itself. And with the difference that the, this particular configuration, there's no documentation and no community, <laughs> nothing, because it's from inside this company. So that's a result of like an early optimization. I, I, I agree with that a lot. And today, like I try not, I, I try not to be dry as much as I can. I, I always think of dry as like, you only create an abstraction if like the business is asking for an abstraction, not like, oh, these two pieces of code look look like the same. That's not enough, right? It's like, yeah, you're gonna f- be fetching stuff like everywhere. It's not it's not enough to create an abstraction. But a lot of times it's like, okay, so you have the button's primary color. That makes sense to abstract because you wanna change in one place, you need every button to to change. Yeah, yeah. it's about abstracting ideas versus abstracting bits of code, right? Because like That's you it. Know, same three lines of code, but but totally different intent. Yeah, yeah you, end, you end up with these abstractions that are like Frankenstein's. It's like a React component for, I don't know, something card, user card that has 17 props to be able to accommodate like the user card that are used in the 20 different places of your application. Yeah, and then you've got so, things like it's used for the current user and it's used for other people's profiles, and you're like, why? <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that kind that's of thing it. is just, yeah, just write two of them. <laughs> yeah, so Sebastian Markbedge uh, from the uh, React Core team had a, a great talk back in, uh, I forget when, uh, Minimal API Service Area, uh, Learning Patterns Instead of Frameworks. Thinking about that from now is like he was talking about they were trying to reduce kind of the the conceptual overhead of like what what new concepts you had to learn and like specific names and stuff the api surface area and to learn patterns instead and he talked a lot about this kind of concept but now it seems obvious that he was kind of alluding to their work on hooks even all the way back then i got to watch that video again <laughs> wow <laughs> This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So... If you're looking for specific information about the request, 
you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. I think another um, important thing is that sometimes abstractions can be really beneficial but hard to understand. And often, like, the trade-off of having to do a little extra work that the abstraction would have taken away, but gaining a lot of, you know, readability, making it easier to understand and to follow is, like, worth it. So it's like maybe you are you are repeating code um, or you have like boilerplate, but like if people can follow what the boilerplate is doing, if people can understand it, then, you know, sometimes that's like a worthy thing to accept. Like, you know, uh, a lot of people use Redux and like Redux, there's a lot of tools out there that will extract away a lot of the boilerplate for Redux, which can be yeah. great, right? But also, if you don't understand what's happening, what ultimately happens, like for people coming onto the project, they can be like, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know where are these actions coming from. What's, what's happening? And it's like at that point, yeah, you saved some code, but like, is it worth it? Um, and these are always like constraints that you have to deal with. Yeah, and one of the things that Sebastian mentions is like, how easy is it to undo your abstraction later? Because going from uh, an explicit API that happens to be, you know, rep- repetitive to an implicit API is easy, but to go back again is very hard. Yeah, and so uh, this uh, reminds me of uh, one thing I saw once. It's in the Kubernetes code. There's this file, the PV controller. <laughs> Please do not attempt yeah. to simplify this code. <laughs> That's the first thing that they put. It's like, it's one function, one gigantic function, with, with with a bunch of ifs and they say like do not do not try this is like all the business rules are here so it's a bunch of variables it's a bunch of ifs it that's the way that's the way we we want to 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 write it because all all it seems that like all the the questions have answers like in this file so like it's you it's a you can like even like write a diagram of what's happening on, on each function, like the ifs, all the ifs, and we usually think of those as bad patterns we should abstract into smaller functions and stuff mm. like that. And they're taking like the opposite. They're saying like, no, don't don't create anything. Like let's just like keep checking for whatever we need to check. It's a gigantic function. Every line will be super commented. And yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting piece of code. Yeah, that think, file yeah. <laughs> is super fascinating to me because if you read there the comments around that, right? They talk about like the the space shuttle style, which is that <laughs> they wrote it to basically be like to comply with um, NASA's rules around how like software has to be reasoned about because with NASA, like you literally have to be able to go in and say, if this happens, then this happens and this happens. There can't be any side effects. There can't be other things uh, that could potentially happen outside of that, which you get into with abstractions. If, if you're not 100% sure how a function works, it's dangerous to, to use that function, right? Um, especially when you're trying to keep space shuttles flying and in the air. Yeah, that feels like a good, maybe a good indicator that you've abstracted too early when you, every time you go to call a function that you wrote, you're, you're like, I wonder, what does this actually do again? Like, you have to look into it to remember. <laughs> that yeah. seems like a bad sign. Yeah, I've, I've got a friend, um, he was on Ruby Rogues, David Brady, and they were working on a video game. And they had, basically, it was like two lines of code, but it was this heinous math that had to be done, to keep the motorcycle upright in the video game. And yeah, the comment was essentially just accept this as magic, <laughs> right? So you can either just accept that it does what it does because it's completely inscrutable, or you can go read the article that explains the math and why it works and all that stuff. But yeah, for most people, they didn't need to understand the math. They just needed to know that it worked. And so it's like these two lines of code, leave them alone unless you absolutely have to understand them. Yeah, I remember seeing something similar in the Half-Life code, like 
back in the day that there was some little line of code for the rocket launcher or something like that. That was like, the math here is totally wrong, but it works. <laughs> and so I was like, do not touch this. Yeah. This kind of makes me think too, uh, there was an article that I think the the person who wrote it um, kind of has walked back on a little bit to write it a little more clearly, but this concept that like someone is always changing your code. And so unless you have something like that, where it's very explicit, like do not change this code because it works exactly as intended. <laughs> you can never be a hundred percent sure that someone's not going to change your abstraction and that they might just delete something that you have reasoned about in other places as always being true, right? If you have a function that expects an admin user to be passed in and that function doesn't check that it's an admin in some way, someone, A, A, someone could delete the if admin like block and now suddenly you're passing in users that shouldn't have admin access to a function that only allows users with admin access or something like that. So basically just defensive coding, right? Like write your code to be as straightforward as possible because otherwise you never know when someone's going to delete something in one of your abstractions. Yeah. So this is another uh, good argument against <laughs> like creating a, a bunch of those abstractions. I, I, I like to think about, so if I have a piece of code that I am afraid of making a change because I don't know where it's going to break because there will be like tons of like projects depending, depending on it and stuff like that. So I believe that that abstraction was wrongly created and this is not called shared code anymore. It's called coupled code. So it becomes like a bad thing at that yeah. moment, right? So this is the same thing. Like if you are writing uh, something that like needs an, an admin uh, user and it's not like, it's not clear to whoever works on that because... I don't know, this is a library that is being uh, uh, imported by another project. I don't know where. And for their particular use case, it was not really clear. There's no documentation. So they're going to they're gonna change it. So this is like coupled code, right? This abstraction is it's not working the, the way it was. So maybe shouldn't exist or just like document the thing better. It's hard. This, this is really hard. And, and this is another thing that this is pure code. But it has like implications that go beyond a bunch of like architectural decisions that we make, right? So this is one of those interesting things. I, I'm very interested in like things that work in the code level, but have implications that usually when we think about architecture, we, we think about like someone thinking like over the code, you know, it's like, oh, I'm thinking of these big boxes and the way they communicate. But this is like something that can have like, much more implication on how how many accidents you have in production than many other architectural decisions you make, right? That's one of the things that really impressed me about uh, uh, Facebook's code is um, I, I saw so many patterns of, of people using the word invariant, and I was like, I've never heard this word before in my life. Um, and like it, the the word really annoyed me, but then, you know, I learned that I was wrong <laughs> and just, you know, so many of the, the decisions they make about how they build things are just, it like, it doesn't really matter either way, um, like technically, but they do it, it because it's more humane. It's more defensive because they've just seen real humans in the real world make these common mistakes so many times that they, they just fix it in the code and not with documentation, not with comments, but with, like invariants that are stripped out in a production build or whatever. But like, if you do this stupid thing, it's going to tell you that you're dumb. Like, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorite things about React when I first started using it was that the error messages were so good. Yeah. Whenever you mess anything up, you get like a paragraph explaining like exactly what you did wrong and how to fix it, usually linked to the docs. Really nice. Yeah, I think also, um, you know, nobody is writing... Um, the code that ends up on the client's machine ever, right? We have production builds, we have all that kind of thing. Performance, I think, is sometimes a, an idea behind um, the uh, like abstraction. Like you, you mm. want this code to only exist in one place because you're not sending it down the wire in multiple places. But with things like gzip and, and lots of stuff like that, it really doesn't matter. And so, especially when you're building the code base, like you should really focus, I think, on 
the the human side of that code of like who's going to be interacting with this how are they going to interact with it all of that kind of stuff um yeah. you know react is a good example of like even in production you can find they'll they'll throw in that link that has like the error message.html file on the react docs where if you click it in a production build it'll tell you like here's probably what went wrong it like expands the um mm. it's like it's like an error code and it expands that error code into a full error message like yeah at some point that's that that's just there because it's easier on humans like you need good error messages and minified code hardly ever has great error messages yeah that was one major mistake that we made in mutuals is like it was just it was very it was false tolerant to a fault like we just assume that you know what you're doing and you write perfect code and just try its best <laughs> Here at ZocDoc, I started working with a team now that they went like, they they did a lot of work whenever like pager duty pages. This team like works with a, a lot of different projects. It's really difficult to understand like the internals of all the projects that the team is working. But they got they took a lot of time to to make like the pager duty messages when you are on call to have a lot of information, a lot of links to to the to the like confluence docs that will like s- explain what is the the runtime of this particular application or like where are the data dog uh, dashboards and stuff like that and it's like just amazing proactive but, uh, context like that is so valuable especially when dealing with an emergency yes yes so like this is like the the other team that I was working with it's like it's two projects that the team work, and everybody in the team has a lot of context in the in the two projects. So our pager duty messages do not have a lot of things. It's like something's wrong with project A, <laughs> you know. And since like people that work in the team know project A really well, we can debug stuff. But then you think about like training a new dev. It's like so. It's it's it takes time. It takes time, and now with this team, now we, now we learn the the best way to do it. Just put a lot of time in your in your error messages and your troubleshooting documentation. I think um, error message, like errors in general, are a great teaching opportunity because errors are like the kind of key opportunity for people to get frustrated, or if you have a really well presented error message it can be a teaching opportunity for somebody to better understand like how they're approaching this thing so like in you know in react if you're you know trying to i don't know do something and like it messes up and gives you a good error message you're like oh like this thing failed but now i understand like why it failed maybe that teaches me a little bit more about react but like taking that approach is like if this happens how can we teach somebody to avoid this in the future and maybe help them better understand the thing that they're trying to do? Like having that mindset for approaching error messages like makes your system, like it tends to close the loops in your system a lot faster. Yeah, that um, that came up recently. I was like doing a Gatsby site. I love Gatsby, by the way. And like I was running into this crazy bug and I, I did, and I was running into all these these just insane problems. I, I did all the debugging and stuff to find out that basically I had ignored the the thing. You need to have a unique key when you're doing an array of like, ah, oh, I know this. Why did I ignore the warnings? I'm so stupid. But then I fixed it and it was fine. <laughs> yeah. Parallel with that, I'm, I'm thinking now about this that, that you just said, Justin, you know, about the feedback and, and how it can go from like a moment of like frustration to a moment of learning. I did like, I had piano classes for years, right? And having the piano teacher near you is just like having good error messages, right? You're trying to play something in your instrument and you just like fail so when you're alone at home, it's like bad error messages, like you just can't. And then when someone's is where it's like, oh, it's it's look at your hand, like should should try to do this movement here and here. That's why you couldn't do it. And then you learn more and more. So yeah, error messages, good error messages are like good piano teachers. I really like that. <laughs> Things that um that the Elm language does really well, right? Like the, the compiler for Elm is is Elm is a language that compiles down to JavaScript and, and 
the compiler will tell you like very explicitly what you did wrong and how to fix it. I love that. With links to like posts and stuff. This is yeah. really good. Yeah. I love the Elm stuff where it, it like recommends what you probably meant to do. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. So amazing. Um, yeah, it, it's very interesting. And I think you can get some of that in JavaScript. Um, I guess technically it's not in JavaScript, but if you're using like Flow or, or TypeScript or something, you can get a lot of that like, hey, you probably didn't mean to pass in like this type of right type. I think that there's there's interesting things in JavaScript to to fix some of those error messages. And you can even do some of that typing stuff um, with just, you know, if statements say, does this object look like it's supposed to? And if not, throw an error. But it's a lot easier with Flow or TypeScript or, or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this invariant library does something similar, right? You just like keep like putting those those things on your code. They'll give you the feedback. The problem is if you start putting invariants in your code and that's not really an invariant, you want to kill the library at some point. Mm. You want to burn everything down. <laughs> if you have like a bad variant invariant in place, you're like, oh my God, I hate this message so much. Yeah, I need to be really careful with those. Yeah. Something that I've been noticing in the industry in, in general is like this is kind of touching on is the kind of the, the culture has shifted from the olden days where everybody was like, it was like socially good and, and to have like the cowboy engineers that, that knew everything and you'd have to kind of bow down to the, you know, the God of the code. And now it's like everything's been twisted around and all the code is working really, really hard to work as well as possible for the noobs, the, the people that are just joining the team and less geared and oriented towards the, you know, the master coder. Yeah, that stereotype has kind of, yeah, become less popular over the years, hasn't it? But I mean, really, because it like hinders the industry as a whole. It's like, yeah. we have like software problems just grow in complexity. And it's like the more things you need your product to do, the more resources, the more people you need behind that. And the reality is like, we don't have enough people that are like, super trained to do like you know really intense like high level stuff all the time and you know there's like a mental cost to that too like you know you have somebody who's like you know an old whiz and gray beard who comes in and like, <laughs> does this magic and you follow up like even if you're like a you know a senior person and you're you know you like know how to code really well like following up with some of that stuff just to get over the mental overhead of understanding it can be a lot so maybe it's super performant or it does this job super well, but like if only a few people of your team can understand it, you know, that's a risk. Like if people in your team start leaving, then what? So it's just, we want, ultimately the goal is more resilient software that we can get more people to contribute to. So, you know, I think the Cowboys completely still have their place so long as they can be like leaders on their team and educate and include people and make the code better for everybody. Like if your goal is just like, I'm just going to like sit in my hole and do this thing, like, you know, the way that I want to do it and make it like super efficient or whatever, like, you know, that's good sometimes, but like it can be harmful to the organization and harmful to the software system. Hmm. So, yeah. What can we do to like it, do better to like enforce this stuff or, or play along. Like one thing is like adding unit tests that verify that we're like throwing good error messages in weird states and stuff. I think commenting your code is like one of the biggest things. It makes it a lot easier to read. It makes it, I, I read another article recently. I'll have to see if I can find it, but um, basically about the idea that um, like there is no such thing as self-documenting code. Like somewhere you've made an assumption that you need to explain. Um, and mm -hmm. so you might as well just explain everything, which is what the Facebook, like the React code looks like, right? If you look at it, it's commented everywhere. Like it, it explains literally every single step of like, this is where this is being created and this is why this. Ha and yeah, I think it comes down to that kind of like, you know, the, the same thing that you have with closed source software versus open source software you have with knowledge, right? Like knowledge that is only in your head 
is just wrong. Like it's, <laughs> it's definitely wrong. You've made an assumption that is wrong. And until you get it in front of somebody else, you're probably not going to know what that assumption was. And so I love that getting all of that out into the open, even if it's just within your team, you know, you don't have to open source all of the knowledge that you have, but uh, to, to everybody in the world, but getting it out there is really a great way to validate and invalidate the things that are wrong. Right. Can you say that one line again? What would, what was that? The, the, just that uh, uh, it, all the knowledge that you only keep in your head is just wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> if that's the only place this knowledge exists, by definition, it is wrong. Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I am starting to, to, to read a book now. It's a friend here, a work uh, recommended to me. It's called The Principles by this guy, Ray Dalio. And he was uh, thinking like uh, about decision making, right? And he was saying that a lot of times, like you don't have all the information uh, to make a decision and you need to make a decision. So he was starting to think about uh, ways to, syst- to, to be systemic uh, about his decisions when he doesn't know everything. So he started like compiling like a list of principles on how to make a decision and then he was, he said like, okay, I want to start like real world proof this, this principles. Uh, so he published, he, he starts sending to people uh, in work. This is the way I am, I am making decisions. So like, if you, if you see anything that you say, like I call this BS, tell me and I'll, I'll, I'll keep updating them. So they become like a better system for, for making good decisions. And the interesting is that he, he ended up like scale himself in the company because a bunch of people were like, okay, let's, let's ask him his opinion on that. And they just go through the principles. <laughs> they don't even need to, he said like somehow, like I, I really scaled like my, my mind because like this is the set of principles that I used to, to, to make uh, a particular type of decision. And now people don't even need to talk to me anymore. So this is this is interesting. Like uh, to put your ideas out there and gather feedback on on it. As I said, like if something is only inside your head, how will you know, right? If, if, even if you have success, it might have been luck. <laughs> the no. idea might still be wrong. That's like related to something my um, father used to say: is like if you can't clearly explain it to somebody else, you don't really understand. Yeah, now we come full circle. (laughs) Nice. This episode is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs. And this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash react. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triple Byte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Dave, do you want to start us off with picks? Sure. Um, so let's see. So I, I guess I sort of have two. I, I just recently launched a new Redux course. So I guess I could plug that. It's at pureredux.com. It goes from like basics to advanced stuff. So people can check that out if they want. The other one that comes to mind is I just got this crazy keyboard. It's called a Kinesis Advantage 2. You can Google it. It's like this split keyboard layout which sort of keeps your hands separate and, and is good, better for carpal tunnel and all that kind of stuff. But it's also like learning to type all over again. So that's been fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think those are my two. Nice. Yeah, I had an aunt or a great aunt that uh, she was writing her book and uh, she had one of those keyboards and she needed help with her Mac. <laughs> it was... <laughs> anyway, it took me a minute to get used to it. So yeah, funny stuff. Justin, what are your picks? So I have two picks today. Um, one, so there was this uh, awesome article that was passed around in our internal Slack channel about um, building trust. Um, building trust as a leader, and it's 
it's just great. And I think generally it applies to just like anybody and everybody. It's just like good human things to do. So definitely check that out. And the other thing is like not in JavaScript related, but you know, I find that uh, the longer I spend as a as a developer working on like web projects, the more complexity there is, the harder things are to build and to understand and to follow. Um, so I've, I've been just thinking about like other projects and there's a project that's out um, that's really interesting. It's called uh, Phoenix Live View. So it's a uh, it's an Elixir world feature, but it, it's a new way to build applications where actually the server is holding the UI state, um, and it has like a React like paradigm for rendering. Anyway, it's really it's a novel approach to to building UI, and I think that it's something that people should definitely look into. All right, Thomas, what are your picks? Okay, so I have two. Um, one is a JavaScript thing, and one is a human thing. I'll start with JavaScript first. Noflowjs.org, that's my the shirt I got on today. It's a, it's a really cool library for doing a flow-based programming for JavaScript. Uh, they've also gotten it working with like, um, like a Arduino boards and stuff like that. So you can do, it, it's, it's a fascinating way of separating the, the flow control logic of your software from the actual like software logic. It's like, nodes and noodles kind of event stuff. You can like reconfigure your entire uh, connected system while it's running or like upgrade parts of it and, and re-noodle everything together while it's all running. And it's very, very interesting stuff. It's based on uh, flow-based programming ba- that's been used since like the 70s. It's, it's all like compatible with those same concepts. It's very, very cool stuff. Uh, and also the people behind it are very, very cool people. <laughs> and also the, uh, the human th- uh, thing, I just started reading, it is the book uh, The Laws of Human Nature by Robert Greene. He's the same guy that wrote uh, 48 Laws of Power. Super deep dive into how humans work and why that's a problem. <laughs> nice. Lucas, what are your picks? All right, so I have two picks today, too. Uh, one pick, let me get here the link. I came across uh, this website of a professor called Pamela Zave, and she has a FAQ sheet on feature interaction. She's mostly talk about uh, features, feature interaction, telecommunications stuff. But it's like so interesting to 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 read about like how do you how uh, about all these cases of features interacting in a product in in her case telecommunications product and by reading those those examples I'm really like thinking about all the features of all the products that that I've worked and how things can get crazy really quickly so this talks a lot about like complexity and these stuff that we try to f- solve all the time with software. So it's really good read, makes you think ab- about a bunch of stuff. And my second pick is this blog post. It has a lot to do with the things that, that we talked about today by Cindy Shridharan. I'm pretty sure I'm not pronouncing her name correctly. It's called Small Functions Considered Harmful which is a lot of really good, yeah, really good uh, arguments against making small functions that I think uh, has everything to do with everything that we were talking here today and like complexity in code that I've encountering through the years and I'm trying to solve too. So these are really good readings for your commute time or before bedtime, those 50 minutes we talked earlier. They work really great. These are my picks. Very cool. I'm going to throw in a few picks here. So uh, next week, I'm going to be at MicroConf, which means I won't be here. And uh, that's a conference for small businesses. And I've, I've gone every year for the past like four or five years. It's a terrific conference. If you're looking to start a business, especially a software as a service, they, they are. It's, an, it's a terrific conference. Um, it was put together by, um, oh, I forget their names now, but it's, it's the guy that created Drip, which is the email marketing system and dang it 
I'm, I'm going to have to go look it up now. They, they host the podcast startups for the rest of us. Rob Walling and Mike Tabor. Yeah, those guys. And now, and now I feel bad. I'm going to see them in a week and I forgot their names. Anyway, but uh, yeah, they're terrific guys and it's, it's a, a, usually a terrific conference. Um, what's funny is, is more than any other conference that I go to, I tend to browse the hallway track and then make it to like the one or two sessions that I absolutely need because they record all the talks and provide them to the attendees. <laughs> and so then I just go back and watch the rest of them later because the content's terrific too. But by far, the biggest thing with that one is the networking. And there's just no way to get around to talk to everybody. It's also the conference that I typically go to with a couple of questions that I want answered about how I'm running the business of podcasting. Hmm. And um, I almost always get referred to somebody who has the right answer for me. So, nice. yeah, loving that. So, uh, yeah, I'll be in Las Vegas this this week and uh, looking forward to that. And then uh, the other pick that I have, and this one's kind of a, I'm not sure exactly how to link it up for our show notes, folks. I'll probably just put in some links to some photographs of it. But there's a company out there called... <laughs> My brain's not working today. Anyway, there's a company out there and they built a podcasting booth that they take out to podcasting conferences. And, uh, you know, they allow people to book time in their booth. And anyway, they're a terrific company. It was funny because I ran into them at uh, PodFest and they it's it's Buzzsprout. That's at buzzsprout.com. I ran into them at PodFest and I started talking to one of the guys that was manning the booth. And I was like, oh, well, how'd you build this? And blah, blah, blah. And, and then he asked me what I did. And so I talked to him about the podcast for a minute. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, so uh, you know, what do you do for them? And it turned out he was one of their programmers and that he was a listener to Ruby Rogues. Nice. <laughs> so, so I got the, oh, <laughs> awesome. you're that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, they've been a terrific help. And I'm really looking at uh, putting together my own booth that looks a lot like theirs and going out to conferences. So... Um, I'm probably going to cool. put up a Kickstarter here within the next few days. So by the time this goes live, it, it'll be up and you should be able to go contribute to that. But what I'm hoping to do is have enough money to pull it together, which is probably like five or $600. And then um, have enough money in the bank so that I can actually ship it and myself out to a couple of conferences. Maybe I may have to actually pay for the booth space. I'm hoping eventually to convince the conferences just to, you know, pay my way out so that, you know, but then we can invite other podcasters in the space. So other React podcasts in the case of React conferences or whatever to come out and actually do podcast episodes and work with the conferences to get their speakers on and things like that. Uh, maybe get some of the co-hosts out. So, you know, I would go come out and, you know, maybe one of our regular panelists come out and that way we can book time too and we can get those uh, interviews in in a setting where it's a little bit easier sometimes to nail people down rather than trying to get on their schedule and get them to come online and, and talk to us this way. So that sounds anyway. like a lot of fun. Yeah. That sounds awesome. So yeah, I'll put, I'll put a link in for the Kickstarter and uh, yeah, um, I would, I would appreciate the support there. Maybe do some video too. Of building it. Oh, building it. And you know, oh, video I'll... at the, Oh, in the booth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I could do that. Probably maybe get some uh, green screen material or something and yeah. Velcro it on or something. Yeah, fun ideas. Conlon, what are your picks? Yeah, cool. Um, so my first one is just uh, Dev2, um, which is a site where I write most of my blog posts. It's a really, really great community. Uh, I'd recommend it for anyone of really any skill level to go write there. There's a lot of great posts by junior developers and a lot of great posts by seniors. It's also completely open source. So if there's something you want to see changed, you can make a PR for it, uh, which is really cool. And they're still a company. Um, they're like a fully open source company that like makes money from sponsors and stuff. It's really neat. My second thing, if it's cool, if I plug another podcast, it's not mine, but Soft Skills Engineering is um, a really, really great podcast uh, about kind of the human side of programming, which we've talked a lot about, I think, on this you know, episode here. I just I really enjoy their content. Um, it, it's really good at kind of covering everything from like how do I switch jobs to like I have a teammate that's not doing something well. How do I explain that to them? And then I had one more, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, I remember what it was, uh, and I'll put a link to it soon. Here I am going to be starting a Discord server for um, 
new developers to come on and get help, have some study rooms, things like that. Um, so if anybody is interested in joining that and getting involved, I will share a link for that too. Cool. Very cool. All right. Uh, Conlon, if people want to find you online, where do they find you? Yeah. Um, most places I am just was. So W-U-Z, except for Twitter, uh, where I am call me was. I also have a website that is was.fyi. And then I write a lot on Dev2. And that's just Dev2 slash was. Nice. Yeah. And the Soft Skills Audio, both of those guys were on JavaScript Jabber for a long time. Nice. All right. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. But thanks for coming and talking to us about all this stuff. This was a lot of fun. All right. Well, we will wrap this up and we'll be back next week, folks. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more. <laughs>